Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. We are in a summer series called Stories of Jesus. Stories of Jesus. We've been looking through the Bible. We've been looking at miracles. We've been looking at healings. We've been looking at interactions with Jesus, things that he accomplished, things that he did. And today, today's title is this, Run to the Table. Run to the Table. If you're taking notes, write that down. Run to the Table. If you're not taking notes, pretend for a second that you are and just look down and help a brother out. We're going to look at the book of Mark. Mark chapter 6, verse 53. And this is what it says. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of uh, Gesenerat and anchored there. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him. Who's that? Jesus. They recognized Jesus. They ran through that whole surrounding region. What did they do? Ran through the whole region. They ran all through Middletown. And began to carry about on beds... Those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. I mean, yo, could you just imagine a bunch of people running around with like gurneys and carts trying to find out where Jesus is. Wherever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch the hem of his garment. As many as touched him. Say that. As many as touched him. How many? And how many is that? All of them. Everyone who touched his garment. As many as touched. Every single person that touched Jesus were made well. I'm going to take a moment and pray. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. That it will not return to you void. I pray that this word lands on the ears that would hear. That your wood, word would be planted in good soil today. Reaping a harvest in due time. Open the eyes of our understanding. Enlighten us to your truth. Show us things to come we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Unlike all of our other stories. This story does not highlight one specific healing. It does not highlight one specific miracle. It does not highlight one specific way that we could get healed or have a miracle through Jesus. It's a multitude, it says. As many as came to him, healings and miracles occurred. But there are some things that we can glean from this word. And let's go ahead and go back to the top and break this down. It says this, when they crossed over... They had came to the land of Gesenerat and anchored there. A parallel uh, verse in the Bible is Luke 5.1. So if you ever want to go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, many times you can find the same story. Same story, Luke 5.1. Uh, so it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gesenerat. What were the people doing there? They came to hear. They came to hear the word. They came to hear the word. And it's funny today, if we ever like had another uh, revival meeting where people were being healed, I bet you people would get on planes, fly all over the country just like this. But instead today, we don't really care about hearing the word. We just want the healing. I just want the miracle. Right? Right? We got the faith because we got on a plane and flew to wherever this person was. But just, yo, just give me the healing. We're going to show up late. We ain't even going to show up for worship. We're going to walk in 25 minutes late. Right? We don't even care. So we know, like, the service structure, right? Like, there's going to be music. Then there's going to be preaching. And then the person's going to open up the altar. That's what, we'll just come for that. Come on, let's be for real, right? We like it fast food, drive through. These people came to hear the word. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. 
Luke 5, 1 in a different translation says this. Now it came about while the people came pushing to hear him, or near him, to have knowledge of the word of God. They came near him to gain knowledge of the word of God. Why are Christians destroyed? For a lack of knowledge. Knowledge, right? See, we want to develop leaders here. We want to build relationships here. We want to heal hurts here. And how are we going to do that? With knowledge. With knowledge. We've got to get this in our hearts and in our heads. Heads and hearts. Hearts and heads. Luke 5, 1 in the message translation. I like this one. Once when he was standing on the shore of the lake Gesserat, the crowd was pushing in on him to better hear the word of God. I love it. Notice this, that Jesus was in Gesenerat, the people were not here for healing, but for hearing. In this moment, the people were not here for healing, they were here for hearing. They were here to gain knowledge. I need to know more about this Jesus, this Messiah. I need to know more. The word of God put faith, expectation, and then action into the heart of the people. This shows us the spiritual hunger of these people. That they were hungry for the word of God. When you have an honor and a respect for the word of God, manifestations of that are not far behind. Why don't we see more things happen on a Sunday morning church environment? This is no shade. Let's just look at fact. We just don't expect it. We expect the church to follow their, their outline. A couple songs, a little water baptism, get up to preach, go home. We don't really expect God to interrupt our service and plaster us with the anointing. Well, all right, just, just throwing it out there. Spiritual hunger is key to receiving what you need from God, okay? Now here's my analogy. There are people that come to the dinner table and are not very hungry. So yesterday, I did a funeral. Uh, Pastor John Mark and I, we went out to eat afterwards. By the time I got home, my wife was like, all right, you know, dinner's ready. I was like, I'm not really all that hungry. But guess what? If it's good food, your boy gonna eat it. You don't get a belly like this without overeating because the food is good. You know what I'm saying? Come on, somebody. But I went to the table not very hungry. There are other times that you go to the table and you're downright starving, right? Your stomach hurts so bad, your stomach thinks your throat's been cut. I ain't been fed so long, I'm hungry, Right? So when people come to the things of God, when they come to the table of the Lord, he says that he prepares a table for us. There are people that come to that table, not very hungry. I'm not really, wait, what are we eating? Brussels sprouts? Mm. I, almost, I almost don't tell the church what I'm going to preach about or who's preaching on a Sunday. Because it's just like that. Oh, it's not, I don't really, eh. That sermon's not really going to be for me. That series isn't really going to be for me. I'm, I'm not going to go to the table. That ain't P. Mike preaching. I'm not going to go to the table. I'm not going to go today. Right? They go to the table a little picky about Brussels sprouts. A little picky about, oh, wait, they're serving me. I'm a vegetarian. Oh, it's chicken. I'm a pescatarian. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Presbyterian. Come on, somebody. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But there are other people that go to the table, and it don't matter what, sir. I'm hungry. I'm going to consume anything of the word. I'm going to consume anything that's brought to me because I'm hungry. And what is the difference? What's the difference between the two? Ready? The way they regard the table. What's the purpose of the table? The Bible says that God prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. What's the purpose of the table? To be fed. And guess what? You know, listen, if you ever had babies, they don't get to choose what they're eating. 
You gave them the, that squash in the can. That junk is nasty. But you made them eat it because you know it's good for them. It's how you regard the table. Is this God preparing the table? Or is this all you can eat buffet and you choose what you want? What do we expect from time at the table? There are some families that when they sit down, it's fancy. So in my family, in my family, the dinner table was sacred, right? We ate at the dinner table every single night, the whole family. Now I said whole family, there's only four of us. So it wasn't that big, but I'm just saying. You could say anything you wanted to say at the dinner table. It was open family discussion time. So that's where I got to demonstrate all the dirty jokes that I learned at school. It was okay at the dinner table time. But you get caught telling that joke later, you get pop out. I'm just saying, that, that was kind of, so what do you expect at your table with the Lord? Is there communication? Is there fellowship? Because other times the dinner table wasn't so fun. You're going to eat everything on your plate. My mom and dad tried to feed me liver. If you eat liver, you're not even saved. You need, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. My mom's like, I made liver and onions. Satan. You're going to eat everything on your place. I can't eat liver. I can't eat this. Mom, you're going to eat it. And I'm eating. <coughs> I threw up all over the dinner table. Never made me eat liver again. Right, so that day, like, the dinner table wasn't fun. The dinner table was angry. The dinner table was corrective and strict. And See, you're not going to run to the table of the Lord if you think he's mad at you. You're not going to run to the table of the Lord if you think you're not good enough for him. The Bible says... Those who fear the Lord, with them, he will share the secrets of his covenant. That's at the table. That's at the table. And we're not talking about people who are afraid of him. We're talking about people who honor him. That's all free. Free information there. When you come to the table and you're not very hungry or you don't care for the things that are prepared at the table, you'll let things pass you by. You got to go back and look at last week's message. Or two weeks ago, who was I here last week? Yeah, last week. Where this Canaanite lady asks for the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And that could be the food that just passes by that's not consumed, that we're not in the mood for. But people that are hungry for the word are not going to let anything pass them by. They're taking whatever is available to them. I've been working at kids camp the last few weeks. It feels like the last few years. But I've been working at kids camp 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. every single day. And when it comes time to lunch, those kids, yo, you, all, you see all sorts of sin begin to arise at the lunch table, right? You've got envy, strife, jealousy. Come on. What do you got? I want that. How come they got I want that. I want their lunch. Now you got what we're providing for you. Those kids eat everything. Half of it's on the floor. Half it's up their nose. I want to say this to you today, guys. It matters how you approach the table of the Lord. It matters how you approach the table. We need to be constantly hungry for the next step with God. The next move of God. The next meal from our Lord. He says, I give you your daily bread. We should be ready for that. I know there's some of you that don't like eating breakfast. But you need breakfast from the Lord. All right? You need that morning bread. You need some Eggo waffles from the Lord. You need a little, come on, you need a little French toast. Your healing is connected to your hearing. Your miracle is connected to your hearing. Your miracle is connected to what you hear. What are you hearing about God? If you hear that God is angry and that he's punishing, you're never going to come sit at the table. But if you hear that God loves you just the way you are, 
but he loves you too much to leave you that way, you're going to come to the table and get coached how to be the better you. Many times people want the word, but they don't want to take the time to hear the word and receive the word. They want what the word promises. All right, we're going to move on from this. We need to position ourselves. Position ourselves to hear the word. And these things are not automatic. We have to cooperate with the word. Cooperate. We have to cooperate with what God is doing in our lives. This means to work jointly with someone toward the same end or result. We need to work with God. If you're believing God for a healing or a miracle, then we need to work jointly with that. Right, can I just throw something out there? Okay. You're believing God to be healed from diabetes. Stop eating sugar. I'm just going to take an extra pump of insulin. That's not working together in cooperation. It's not. Okay, I'm just saying, I'm just throwing that one out. Whatever it is in your life that you're believing God for, work in cooperation with him. If there is a healing that you're looking for, then open your Bible. Find all the healing verses. Build your spirit up in cooperation with what God is doing. So you do what you can do in the natural, and he will do what you cannot do in the supernatural. Check this out in Deuteronomy 30, verse 15, going old school, Old Testament. Now listen, today I am giving you a choice. Life or death, prosperity or disaster, blessing or cursing. He goes on to say it again in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. Today I have given you a choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice that you make. Dude, that's heavy. <laughs> Look what he says. Oh! That you may choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice. How? By loving the Lord your God, obeying him, and committing yourself firmly to him. This is how you choose life. This is how you do it. Love God, obey him, and do what the Bible says. This is the key to your life. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land of your Lord that he swore to give you to the ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Listen, God does not adjust himself or rewrite his word to accommodate your gluten intolerance. We're just going back to your preferences of food, right? I don't like vegetables. Vegetables are nasty. You know why you don't eat vegetables? Because your mom didn't spank you. Right? Your mom did not give you a bow bow when you spit out your spinach. <laughs> God doesn't rewrite his word because you didn't like what's served for dinner. Woo! You got to go, go chew on that, pun intended. We must adjust our lives our hearts, and our beliefs to accommodate him and receive from him. You got to think of that one. You got to think of that one. I'm going to show you this in Luke chapter 4. I know we got a lot of Bible today, but we're studying. Luke 4 verse 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. Right, his own hometown. As his custom was. He went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up and read. He was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. Watch what he says. He, he read out of verse 18 here. The spirit of the Lord has been upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover sight to the blind and set liberty to those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus preaching this. 
in his own hometown. Then he closed the book. He gave it back and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He's saying, I'm, I'm fulfilling Isaiah before you. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. Then they said, but aren't you Jojo's son? Aren't you Jojo's son? Aren't you the little Jesus from the block? Aren't you the little Jesus from the block who did all that weird magic stuff when you were a kid? Huh? Come on, somebody. They disqualified him. I knew you when you were in diapers. I've been in this church since you were a little baby. Is this not Joe's son? He said to them, you will surely say this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, surely I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Now I'm trying to show you guys something here, but you're still making me Jojo's son instead of the son of God. But I truly tell you, many widows were in Israel the day of Elijah when the heavens shut up for three years and six months. And there was a great famine brought all, all out on the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except Zarephath in the region of Sidon. I'm just, we just got to get to the part where I want to get to. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. And none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So what is he saying here? He, he's really saying that God can't just go and do whatever he wants. There are things that will block God. Come on, listen. I ain't, I ain't trying to pick a fight with the sovereignty of God. I 100% believe in the sovereignty of God. But there are multiple times in Scripture where God wanted to do something, but the people rejected it. They pushed the Brussels sprouts to the side. Watch 28. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. The Christ, the Messiah, just prophetically spoke to you, and it ticked you off. You got angry. They rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill in which the city was built, that they might throw him off the cliff. These people who are studying, yo, these are like believers. They're studying the word. The word is standing in front of them and they didn't recognize him not. I'm not in the mood for this. This is tasty to me. You're just Jojo from the block. You're just Jojo's son, Jesus, from the block. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. He dusted the dust off his feet. I tried. I tried to bring you healing. I tried to bring you deliverance. I tried to bring you miracles. But you weren't in the mood. You wanted something different. You wanted something spectacular. He proclaims that he is the anointed one. He proclaims his anointing. But they would not. They rejected him. They wouldn't receive him. They did not cooperate with the power of God that was present that day to receive and was there to meet them. They didn't cooperate. They came to the table already full or not interested in what was being served. And that's the concern for our local church today. We are easily fed by so many online experiences. We go looking for the tasty treats. I don't really want dinner, I want ice cream. Let me go find the ice cream sermon. Let me go find the coconut custard sermon. Let me go find the peanut butter palm getting hungry. <laughs> that by the time your own ministry is ready to feed you, you're full and not in the mood for steak and potatoes. No shade. 
I'm not throwing any shade. I'm just saying that there, we're in a moment of time that is dangerous for the local church. There's, it's dangerous for the local church. We now have a new term for people who have left church from COVID. Previously churched. We have the unchurched, we have the churched, now we have these people who are previously churched. Previously leaders of the local church, previously involved in leading their churches, now no longer interested in what served at the table. The word of God must be part of our daily consumption. It must be part of our daily lives. The word, listen to me, the word is the container of faith. The word of God is the container in which faith is going to be served to you. Without it, there is no faith. When you partake of the word of God, you get the contents of it too. Okay? When you grab a hold of a bag of Doritos, you get to open it and consume its contents. But if you never take the bag of Doritos, you can never consume the contents. If you never take the word of God and open it up, you cannot consume its contents. When you get the word, you get the faith. The people from Gesenerat didn't just come for healing. They came for the word. Mark 6, 54. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him. And they ran through the whole surrounding region and began to carry about on beds those who were sick wherever they heard he was. See, so there's, there's a second step to faith. First, faith comes by hearing. So faith hears. The second step is faith sees. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. You see, faith sees before it's seen. Faith sees before it's seen. Immediately the people recognized him. They remembered him from what they were taught. They responded to what they knew about Jesus and they ran. They ran. People that are not expecting don't run. People that are not expecting don't run. You ever seen on these Black Friday sales where people lined up in front of Walmart for nine hours? I'm just telling you, there ain't nothing more important at Walmart that I'm going to be online for nine hours. And then get trampled over to run to get a special buy TV. But there's this expectation. There's an expectation they're going to get that TV for 200 bucks. See, because people who expect run. Mark 11, 24. Therefore I say to you, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you shall receive them, you will have them. Four things in prayer. Have a desire. Pray. Believe or have faith. And then receive. See, a lot of people leave the package on the front step. We got ring doorbells today. We got Nest doorbells. We got ADT doorbells. We get to preview what's on the porch without even going out there. God's saying, man, I've got a blessing for you. I don't want to get up the couch and get that right now. Just come receive it. Come receive it. Man, it's a little inconvenient. Come on, somebody. Sometimes we don't have a faith problem. Sometimes we have a receiving problem. Sometimes we have a receiving problem because we have a pride problem. You ever had somebody try to give you a gift, but you couldn't receive it? No, I couldn't. You have a pride problem. Because you're blocking them from getting a blessing. We can't be passive in receiving. We cannot be passive in receiving. Kids camp, one more time, just because it's so fresh in my mind. We pull out a bag of Starburst candies. Start giving one Starburst candy to each kid. You're mobbed. 
five seconds, you're mobbed. Can I have one? Can I have one? Can I have one? Can I have one? Do you know why we don't come to God that way? Because we are broken. We broke our kids. We did. We broke our kids. That's not polite to ask. That's not being polite. Stop that. And, and really what is, you got embarrassed by their persistence to ask. So now you broke them from their persistence to ask. And now they can't go to God that way. Because that's not polite. That's not honoring. I'm trying to help somebody here today. <laughs> Matthew eleven twelve in the Amplified. And from the days of John the Baptist until the present time, the kingdom of heaven has suffered or endured violent assault. And it is the violent men that will seize it by force as a precious prize, a share in the heavenly kingdom is sought with the most ardent zeal and intense exertion. And we're not talking about anger violence. We're talking about that. What about me? Can I have that too? If someone else is being blessed, can I be blessed too? If someone's laying on hands, can I lay hands too? We lost that. Because that's not polite. It's not polite to ask. That's why Jesus said, if you want the blessings of God, you've got to come to me like little children. Little children don't know this. They don't know how to not ask. They're going to ask. They don't know it's not theirs. Everything's theirs. God says, come to me like a little child. Take it. Take what I have for you. People from Gesenerat were aggressively desiring to receive from Jesus. I want to give you five things, leave you with five things that faith does. Faith does. If you want to ever wondering if you're in faith or if you're, what level of faith that you're at. Here we go, ready? Faith hears. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So number one, faith hears. The second thing faith does is faith sees. It sees before it's seen. Number three, faith speaks. Faith speaks, it is mine. It is mine. I want that, Lord. If you got something for me, I want it. Wait, wait, only one starburst? I want two. Are you really going to come to God like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't want anything that's not mine, but I want everything that is mine. Faith speaks. Ready? And then that leads you to faith acts. You have to act on your faith. If you don't act on the faith, it's just going to sit on the front porch. Faith has to get up and answer the door. Faith acts. The action is getting up from your slumber, going to the door and opening it. Once you open the door, you can do the final step. And what is that? Faith receives. Faith receives. Let God bless you. For goodness sake, get out of his way and let him bless you. Don't always reach for the check. Too many Christians always reaching for the check, man, spiritually. No, I got to earn this. I got to deserve this. No, God, let me pay. Let me pay. You really don't want to pay. Because your payment is hell. Your payment is death. Come on, somebody. The wages of sin is death. The payment is death. Jesus paid that payment. All you have to do is receive the blessing from your Lord. Receive from him. Mark 6, 56. Wherever he entered. Wherever he entered. Whether it was a small village, a mid-sized city, or a big countryside. They laid the sick in the marketplace. They begged, they asked that we could touch the hem of your garment. And as many that touched him, they were made well. Let me leave you with some ideas today, some thoughts. How are you approaching the table of your Lord? How do you approach your morning devotions? 
How do you approach a Sunday experience? How are you approaching a need from the Lord? How you approach God matters. How you approach your destiny, your future matters. Second thing I want to ask is, who have you invited to join you at the table? If you're enjoying all the blessings that God prepared for you and the meal is good, who are you inviting? I know there's some people who are more introvert and they don't really like throwing house parties and have people over because then my table's dirty and I got to clean up. So much work. Who are you inviting to the kingdom with you? Who are you inviting to eternal life with you? Who are you inviting to partake of the goodness of God with you? And I want you to take a moment and look at the table in your life and say, what is the good things that God has already provided for me? It's so easy for us to get neurotic and point out all the bad things. But what are the great things that God has provided for us? Some kids, house, dog, finances, nice car, good job, clothes you have on, you're healthy families in church, like, what's already there? What's already the blessing? Look around the table. God, you give me so many good things. It's so easy to look at someone else's table and get jealous of what's on their table because I don't have that. I promise you, whatever God has prepared and put on your table is exactly what you need right now to nourish your spirit, to nourish your soul, to nourish your body. Don't try to live five years down the road or be stuck in the past. I don't want leftovers. I don't want his leftovers. I don't want to eat from five years ago. I don't want to keep duplicating what happened in 1985. I want today. What do you have for us today, God? If you're here today and you've never taken a seat at the table of the Lord, you've never sat down to have a relationship with him, I want to offer that to you today. If you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and join the family of God, that is your next step. That is your first step. Take that step of faith. Your second step after that would be something like water baptism. But today, if you've never taken that step towards God, you've never sat down at the table of the Lord, salvation is that step. And what is salvation? Romans 10, 9 tells us, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. That's it. It's a belief. I believe that Jesus is Lord, and I'm going to say it with my mouth. It's a public confession. If you're here today, and you've never had that opportunity, Family Church would love to pray this prayer out loud with you. And it goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer for the very first time, would you fill out our online connect card? A host would love to connect with you and send you our six-day devotional called Starting Point. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that. And you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.